Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Comstock Report. I'm Marlon Bowling with you, and I'm joined by Eric Relf of Comstock Investments. We're going to dive into the USDA numbers that came out on Thursday. Now, keep in mind, there will be no market activity tomorrow on Friday. The market will be closed in observance of a good Friday. So that means a long three-day weekend before the markets will be trading again. However, Eric, I believe the market will be trading Sunday night. Is that correct? That's the way I understand it as well, Harlan. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we'll plan on that. And uh, maybe that'll be our first chance to do any uh, follow-up trading. But it was an interesting day. Make sure you like this video and share this video and subscribe to it. Hit that bell icon down below so you can get notified when we have new updates. Okay. So the markets had kind of a crazy close. They were, uh, I guess they finished with pretty modest gains, pretty strong gains in the corn but they kind of stumbled across the finish line after all these numbers came out. So first, let's look at the report. Eric, if you would, let's walk through the acreage numbers and give me your thoughts on the way that they came out compared to what they were expected to be. Yeah, so first and foremost was going to be the corn, and that was where the most attention was going to be paid. And and the average estimate was 91.8 million acres. Um, There were a plethora of analysts who were looking for 92 or more. And, you know, you look at the range of estimates was anywhere from 90 to 93 and a half. Um, And most were in that 92 area. So obviously 91.8, kind of the median there. And anything around 90, we knew was going to be bullish. There were a couple of uh, respectable firms and, and analysts that we had personally talked to that were sub 90 on their estimate, not much, but uh, 89.7, 80, 89.8, those kind of numbers. And so um, leading into this thing, we were kind of favorable that that the corn could see some upward momentum um, just because their methodology has been proven. And and they are, like I said, they are respectable outfits and, and they almost nailed it. I mean, we came in at 90 million smooth. That was below what most thought, obviously the bottom end of the estimates. So that was very supportive. Uh, Immediately, you start sending corn higher. You go to beyond 20 cents higher uh, in virtually every contract. And and, and we did slough off to the end. You know, there's a lot of people when you see a 20 cent move in a corn market that hasn't moved 20 cents in months, you're going to see some profit taking. And and we saw that today, especially ahead of this three day weekend. So that happened. Uh, we, We couldn't hold the top of the range. However, nice finish. This should be a number that in conjunction with maybe some improved export sales, maybe some problems in Brazil, uh, increase in feed demand, any of those things could happen that would then start to work our ending stocks lower. However, even at 90 million, if we do make a trend line yield, we're not going to be doing anything to help ourselves on the on the carry out number after this crop year. So we're going to have to have some trouble with the crop this year to for this to really make a lasting uh change to the market otherwise we're not far from price to where we ought to be at this juncture anyway so we'll see how this plays out for a little while um soybeans right in line 86 and a half most were between 86 and 87 we came right in there uh that wasn't any surprise really not a market mover soybeans were uh, less than a dime uh either side of unchanged all day even with corn ripping and wheat as well wheat comes in at 47 and a half uh, still middle of the range, close to what the uh, average trade estimate was. Um, but we had some other stuff going on with wheat. Uh, we can kind of talk on some of those points if we want to, but uh, wheat was very well supported and kind of followed corn almost neck and neck following the report. We saw 20 cent gains in the wheat and, and ended up in that 15 range. So a uh, very nice day for corn and wheat means moot point. Uh, it's all going to be about what these private estimates look like coming out of Brazil. Right now, they tend to be favoring the USDA number more, uh, moving away from that CONAP number. So we still got some figuring out to do down there. Let's talk about the stocks numbers that came out. Uh, yeah. Any surprises in those? Um, definitely no surprises. Um, the the corn, soybean, and wheat numbers were right in line with where they should have been. Um, I would say the big takeaway from today and and what has maybe ignited some of these markets, mostly the corn and wheat, obviously we've already talked about that. But I I think maybe the biggest thing um, is wondering what are the acres going to and are we gonna recover them back into grain acres? And so, you know, the stocks numbers, uh, a little lower in corn that helped, but that was just a direct result of that change in acreage. 
Um, but otherwise, soybeans and wheat were pretty well directly in line with the trade estimates, uh, nothing going there. So now we got to figure out what's the land going to, and that's going to be the debate as we go through the weekend and start next week. Now, there were some uh, maps that were put out by USDA that represented how much each individual state was going to go up and down on acreage and that sort of thing. Just wondered if you had a chance to look at those and if anything really jumped off the page at you there. Um, I honestly didn't have time to dissect them very well. Uh, we're, we're two hours post report as we're, as we're prepping for this recording. And so, uh, haven't had a lot of breathing room to, to dig into those things yet. Um, mainly just been going through the numbers, but uh, I, I guess what jumped out at me was the transition away from corn everywhere. Um, and I don't know, I don't know if we're going to see a shift into more pasture ground. Um, you know, you, you can look crop by crop, you know, corn was lower than expected. Soybeans were slightly lower than expected, but very close. Wheat, pretty much in line. Cotton was even lower than expected, which shocked me. I, I couldn't believe the cotton number when it came out. Um, the, the sorghum, uh, we, you know, we talked about this amongst ourselves, Marlon. And we thought, boy, they're, they're probably going to be enticed to plant more milo in the plain states. And that number comes out lower. Uh, oats, same thing. Barley, same thing. Rice, same thing. I mean, it was close to in line, but lower, lower, lower across every major crop. Uh, so I don't know. There, there's a lot of uh, tinfoil hat conspiracies going around on social media right now because what did the acres just disappear? Well, they're going into something. You know, I, I made the argument maybe they're maybe they're transitioning to Dollar Generals, but uh, I don't think that's probably the case. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, realistically, what what kind of excuse would there be for something like that? I mean, something has to account for that. In in my opinion, it's it's going to be either some government program enrollment CRP, um, or just pasture. Um, I think there's a lot of people that are prepping for rebuilding. You know, this is a multi-year process when you're rebuilding a, a cow herd. Um, people have been paying through the teeth for hay for three years now, since we started the first year of the big drought in the West. And and I think I think maybe that has attracted some acres after after continuous trouble finding. I I I've personally followed vehicles from northern Iowa. Uh, leapfrogging back and forth all the way down to eastern Kansas, moving hay, uh, you know, whether it's semis or one ton trucks pulling multi multiple round bales on a flatbed. I mean, it, the, the hay is is moving all over the country because people just can't find it. So I think that is really going to factor in here. And, and I actually had a conversation with a, a a pretty reputable analyst last week about that particular item. And and we thought, well, you know, that's possible. And so when you see a reduction across the board like this, it kind of makes it almost probable at this point. I am uh, looking at one of those maps I was referring to there. <clears throat> and the one I'm looking at right now is uh, for corn. Yep. And it would be the percentage change from a year ago. Large and percent. USDA says that and it, it's kind of amazing. Um, they have the acreage going down 8.1% in Minnesota. 9.1% in Missouri, 6.4% lower in Indiana, Iowa down 2.3%, not too much of a change there. They say Ohio down 83 But then if you go into the deep south, Eric, uh, Arkansas down 27%. Yeah. Uh, they have uh, Mississippi down 25%, Louisiana down 20 Texas down 16 And so it goes uh, throughout the south and southeast. Obviously, that must represent the switch to cotton, doesn't it? Well, you would have thought so till you saw the lower cotton number. <laughs> um, I know we did. We actually did have a discussion a while back that there could be a big increase in peanut acres, but not all the ground is subject to planting peanuts either. No, no. And and the one thing I will say too is, you know, you I, I lived in and and worked with clients in the Delta, um, and they have the ability to switch acreage on a dime. Um, the vast majority are irrigated. They have endless supplies of water. It's cheap to irrigate there. So they have the ability to kind of do whatever they want and they can do it at a moment's notice. And so what we see today versus what reality ends up being, especially in those states, eh, it could vary, but I don't think corn has the, uh, 
impetus to capture anything from these price levels unless we see some major surprise in the next two to three weeks, but I don't see that either. So uh, I wouldn't think it would go back to corn, but I, I think to your point, th those regions, um, yeah, they, they could go, they could go rice, but that wasn't their intentions because we came in a little lower than the average trade estimate there, you know, so they could, they can kind of go wherever they want, but it's not reflected in any of our major crops. So I, Maybe maybe they're going to plant some cocoa plants. I don't know. <laughs> Makes you wonder, doesn't it? <laughs> Looking at the soybean map, they uh, they gave the nod for the biggest percentage gain of all places in Oklahoma. Yeah, up nineteen percent. North Dakota up eleven, and then the gains were more modest in much of the Corn Belt. Iowa up a couple of points. Indiana up four and a half. Ohio up five, then it's just kind of a mishmash of not much of a change, generally just a little higher acreage throughout. You mentioned the wheat a little bit ago, and I'm fascinated by that. It it looks to me like from what we have heard over the past week or so, there may be some changing in the fundamentals behind wheat. Maybe you can elaborate on that a little bit because we're hearing some stories that could have a longer term impact here. Yeah, you know, it's it's probably well, it's definitely too early to tell. And it may be a little early to be thinking that this would have a lot of impact. But uh, we've had low, uh, although double digit temperatures, low double digit temperatures, anywhere from 12 to 19 degrees for days on end. in some of these major growing regions when the wheat plants are double jointed, um, I think you know 19 20 degrees for a night or two isn't going to hurt anything at that stage you get down around 10 degrees for a few nights that could be a big deal so obviously the further north where the colder temperatures were it becomes a bigger situation um but again no matter where you're at it's going to take a little time to play that out once it gets to the boot stage then we've got to watch what those temperatures are doing staying above the 25 28 degree mark uh because you can dip down to 25 doesn't do any damage but if you stay down there for the night you're going to have a problem and, and the long range outlook isn't very favorable for warmer temps for a while here. So the wheat has almost progressed to a point where it could cause itself some problems. But again, it's going to be down the road before we have any answers on that. Well, and I did see one report earlier today that talked about uh, how Russia was holding off on exporting Not 400,000 tons of wheat. Uh, I don't know if it's just an effort to support their own market. If they're trying to choke off supplies coming out of Ukraine or out of the Black Sea, not sure what all is behind that, but that seems like that's making people a little bit nervous too. Yeah, I think that was responsible for the pre-report strength that we saw in the wheat today, and uh, it probably single-handedly actually. Um, but Russia, to me, when it, whenever you have Sobicon coming out and saying, "Oh, well, this crop's not as good as we thought." Um, in conjunction with a move like this, basically holding the wheat captive um, and, and, and keep holding it hostage, uh, I, I would say that that is Russia making a move to support the market, which is ironic considering they've been giving it away for months and crippling everyone else's wheat market, including our own, uh, because they've just been fire sailing it. And now I've, apparently they've hit a, a point where they, they've hit panic mode a little bit and and now they need to bolster prices. And, and that could be any number of things, whether it's to fund their war machine or, or they've realized they're in a, a dire situation and need to feed their people. Um, if, if they implement their version of a draft in Russia, they're going to need every scrap of grain that they can grow, including every kernel of wheat. So it, it may be indicative of a forthcoming war move, but I wouldn't jump to that conclusion just yet. Well, there's also, uh, of course, we've all heard the headlines that there's also growing tension between France and Russia mm -hmm. and Belarus and Belarus. Poland. And they're all kind of getting in there and getting in each other's face. France is also a big wheat competitor of ours, a big wheat supplier to the world market. And it just makes you wonder if down the road, if, if things get kind of dicey there in Europe, that, that could really kind of upset that apple cart when it comes to shipping wheat out of that part of the globe. Oh, absolutely. And nobody will be on a smaller island than Russia uh, with regards to their contact with the outside world. I mean, they, they will be pointed at as the sole purpose, uh, the, the sole reason that this has all happened and why this situation imploded and uh, that they'll be cut off, basically. And so, that, like I said, this may be in preparation for a, a more, more intensification on their war effort. Okay, I'm looking at the livestock trade. We did close higher on the cattle, so it looks like maybe that 
that big threat to the cattle complex earlier in the week uh, <laughs> that seemed to be based on that avian flu case uh, discovery in the Southern Plains. Yeah. Maybe that has now gone in the rearview mirror. What do you think about all that now? I think for the most part, I think people are realizing that it's not going to impact the beef. It's not going to impact the pasteurized milk. There's no um, airborne contagiousness amongst the cattle. It's direct consumption. Um, obviously, uh, maybe they'll start putting their uh, feed piles under nets or something, but uh, this was not a threat that should have wrecked the market. Uh, one day down on Tuesday, not a big deal. We can recover from that pretty quickly, but we need the cash markets to follow for that to happen. And, and so far, we're not seeing quite the improvement from Tuesday that we'd like to see. There was some panic selling on Tuesday. So you had some 185 live trade in Kansas. Uh, you know, Packers were offering up low ball bids on dress trade in Nebraska and Iowa at the same time, although they weren't getting any takers. But the feeder cattle cash got thumped in the sale barns. Um, kill cow prices were down only for a day. They recovered immediately. Uh, that market is just fire hot. Um, so you, you saw the cash markets take a hit on Tuesday, but the main thing is obviously fed cattle cash needs to recover. It needs to do it quickly. And I don't know if we're going to see it this week. Um, the bids are out there matching some of the trade that was seen on Tuesday. We have seen a little improvement in Iowa <clears throat> from, from what we heard on Tuesday. Uh, some 186 live trade. We've actually had a, a handful of deals done at 298 in Nebraska on the dress side. So if we could recover to last week's prices by next week, I don't expect it this week, but if we could do it by next week, then it's all in the rear view at that point. But we do need to see the cash come around. Well, let's talk about next week. All right. So we have three days to think about things. Uh, the USDA numbers will be digested by Sunday evening. Mm -hmm. Uh, as you look at things the way they stand now with the uh, commodity funds having been so heavily net short for a long time, record net short in the grains, um, it, uh, I would imagine they probably lightened up some, especially after that report came out, but it didn't appear to me like it was any kind of a, a rush for the door. Uh, otherwise they would have been limit up right on Thursday. Yeah. This, this wasn't a mass ex exodus. This was, uh, this was just trade. It was high volume trading and. Uh, I would suspect, you know, it, commitment of traders report is just a joke. We get data on Friday as of the prior Tuesday. It's never up to date. Every movement that we've seen in the market since Tuesday is unreflected when we get the data at the end of the week. And as you know, I mean, from, from Wednesday morning to Friday afternoon, this stuff can move a lot. And, and that's not reflected in those reports. So it, it's unfortunate that we have to rely on that or, or pretend that we can rely on that. Um, but they will likely have lightened up a little. Um, we, we've seen it a couple of times in recent weeks, and, and that's probably going to be the case here. And, and the position they'll hold will still be within 5% of record, uh, something along those lines. And again, whether we ever see the real number or not, who knows? So, but no, this, this wasn't a mass exodus. There, there's some resistance levels that if we cross, then you'll start to see a mass exodus, but they're not for another 25 cents in the corn and about 60 cents in the soybeans. So if we could get enough movement out of this to make that kind of a push, then we could start tripping some triggers and, and start flushing them out a little bit. But I don't know if we have the cause for that just yet. Yeah, that, that was my question from your experience, what you thought the trigger point would be to cause them to uh, flip and uh, change positions and, and uh, maybe actually pursue the long side. So we got quite a bit of elbow room if that's the case. Then. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, I, I don't think they're going to get any kind of aggressive liquidation mode until we can take out these gap levels in primary uh, contract months in both corn and soybeans. Uh, that's 503 corn, 1244 November beans, uh, December corn and November beans. Uh, if you take out those levels, then they'll know we've got a real move going on and, and they, they could have trouble on their hands. And But that that's going to be caused by possibly a wet planting season, followed by some turn off to hot, dry, shift to an early La Nina, something along those lines. Okay. Well, Eric, uh, thank you for explaining everything that uh, came down the pike here during this past week. It was a short trading week. 
but it was a power packed week. I'll put it, it that was. way. Boy. Yeah. Now we can uh, get a few days to kind of relax and, and uh, recreate a little bit. But yeah. anyway, we'll look forward to uh, see what the market wants to do on Sunday evening. Remember, it'll get back underway. Globex starts trading around uh, seven o'clock central mm-hmm. time Sunday evening, I guess. So we'll see what it wants to do by then. Eric, I hope you have a happy and safe Easter weekend and we'll check in with you next week. All right. Sounds good, Merlin. You do the same. All right. Eric Ralph with us. He is with Comstock Investments. That'll do it for this episode. Thank you so much for joining us. For producer Brianne Hendrickson, I'm Marlon Bowling. We'll catch you next time on the Comstock Report. Thanks for joining us on our Comstock YouTube channel. Don't forget, you can also find us on Facebook and TikTok as well. 